What's up, everybody? This is Rick the Disciple coming to you again with another podcast. This one is still targeted for uh, the XJ Dubs. Or if you PIMO, physically in, mentally out, this is uh, targeted for you too. Before I get started, I'm just going to ask you to hit that like button for me. And if you haven't subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button. And this is a Keep these podcasts going and spread them out to different folks too. Now, this one, if you've seen the title and you've seen the screenshot there, is a book review uh, about the conquest of Canaan by Jesse Penn Lewis. Now you may be asking, you know, what does this have to do with me as an XJ dub? You know, I'm, I'm just going to say for a minute before you dismiss it, uh, just give some consideration to what's being said here because it, it actually does have relevance for a person who is leaving or have left the religion or especially if you were in Jehovah's Witness religion it has relevance to you and I will will show that uh, as throughout this discussion if you've heard my previous podcast before just uh, you know any of them I have talked about the reality of the spiritual environment that we're in and how the spirit realm is a realm of reality and how you we all of us are dealing with uh, wicked spirit forces demons wicked angels Satan the devil something that was not really emphasized and taught how to contend with these things in the uh, organization of Jehovah's Witnesses but it is a reality that we face and the reason why I uh, like this book is it talks about spiritual warfare, but it's the attitude towards spiritual warfare that's important. That's what I really like about it. A lot of folks who have left Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, look, I'm not, not going to say a lot of folks. All of us who have left Jehovah's Witnesses were victims. Okay, uh, that is a high stress high control religion and the things that are done in it especially with the breakup of the family on how it's done the loyalty required to Jehovah which is really to the Jehovah's Witness religion uh, that causes a lot of stress on people so families do really do break up uh, there's a lot of contention between families even while you're in and then there's really contention if you leave, if one person leaves. But there's more to it. There's been far, far more things that have happened to people. Some so serious, some not so serious, but those really serious things. You know, we've talked about people who have really been victimized uh, through abuse or sexual abuse and things of that nature. So when a person leaves that religion, they walk away from it. They may walk away with a lot of trauma. Some with not a lot of trauma, some with a whole lot of trauma, but they walk away damaged to a certain degree, victimized to a certain degree. The, my goal has always been to move away and get past being a feeling, constantly feeling like we're a victim, turning to Christ to overcome and it is to turn to Christ that's always been my goal so there's things you have to consider when you leave a religion especially one that was so all-consuming in our lives like Jehovah's Witnesses religion was they provided a full spiritual feeding program and I mean it was all-consuming if you read every publication that they put out every watchtower and awake article that came out all the kingdom ministries I don't know what they call them now maybe something different you did all your study for the meetings and you did Bible reading you really did not have time for much reflection and thought because it consumed everything now once you leave all of that now you have to be responsible for your own spiritual feeding program that can be kind of difficult when you we were so structured, you know what I mean? We were structured in, in a spiritual feeding program, but we leave it, and then that 
it's up to us now to fill ourselves and we're going to fill that vacuum with something. Just be honest. Something is going to consume that time and we're going to take it into our minds. So the question is, what are we going to do? How are you going to feel it? And I'm saying that to use God's word and Jesus himself to feel that, that spiritual vacuum. And I mean, when I say Jesus, I mean Jesus directly. Just feel the spiritual vacuum. Jesus even said, even when he was on, on uh, the earth, that his teaching was designed to heal. That's why he often used the scripture in Isaiah that people wouldn't turn back so that he heals them. Uh, and so Jesus himself still being alive is trying to heal people who have been damaged. So let him heal us. Let him clean our mind and get us ready for the spiritual war. The thing is, is that we've always been in the spiritual war. From the time we were born, we were in the spiritual war. And we weren't really taught in Jehovah's Witnesses that we were in a spiritual war for real and then how to battle in that war. So we became a victim of the war, subject to how, however the war was conducted against us in that organization. You break away from the organization, the war does not end. You still have to deal with the effects of what we had to deal with in the organization once we leave. And then the war is still continuing, continuing upon us there. So how do we get into the fight so that we're not always a victim? That's why I like this book. Now just a little bit about it. This was by Jessie Penn Lewis. She lived in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. She wrote this book, I believe, in 1904. She was part of the Welsh revival, spiritual revival that took place in the early 1900s. Uh, now, how does a book that's over 100 years old really apply to us? Well, I'll get into it. I, I want to just say that it does. And this is around the same time that... Uh, that uh, Charles Tash Russell was forming the Jehovah's Witness organization. So they were going throughout Great Britain. So they probably, you know, crossed paths because they started here and then they were over there. If you uh, read and believe all the history of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they were, they probably crossed paths because there was a big spiritual revival going on around the world. But the Welsh one was just in, was just noteworthy in particular in terms of history see back when it was happening it wasn't noteworthy but later on once people kind of settled from it uh, they saw that it was pretty noteworthy so this book is is centered around that time period and jesse penn lewis really showed i, I like this the attitude that we need to have because she recognized that we were in a spiritual war. And then we have to have a certain attitude about warfare. Spiritual attacks are going to come. They're going to constantly come. They're always going to be there. And the thing was learning to recognize these spiritual attacks. And instead of being in a defensive posture, the book helps us with the attitude of getting into an offensive posture. So that when you're fighting and you're, you're in the war and you're fighting, you're moving forward instead of always backing up because you're, you're, we're in some sort of defensive posture because we're always getting hit with the attacks. So we're just subject to the attacks, not the bringers of the attacks. And, and that's why this one is good. Listen, I'm, I'm going to say, let me explain this too, that as you see the title is Conquest of Canaan, it's using the experiences of the Israelites in the time of Joshua. To help us understand what spiritual warfare is all about and how we take the right attitude. There's a, a, a thing, a statement that became known during the Iraqi war called clear, hold and build. Now, I'll give you just a little bit of background. As Let me just say as I understand, understand this. In the George Bush cabinet, there was constant rivalry. A lot of folks, even in his cabinet, did not like the way Donald Rumsfeld was conducting the war in, in, in Iraq in particular. Because Afghanistan was kind of, you know, Afghanistan at that time was sec became secondary. So they're in Iraq. So people didn't like the way Rumsfeld was conducting the warfare. Now, Clear Holding Bill actually came from Condoleezza Rice. A lot of people took Condoleezza Rice as a, as a, as a figurehead of nobody. She was kind of irrelevant. 
uh, kind of a uh, what do you want? What's the term? Where someone just parrots what the president wanted her to say that she didn't have a mind of her own. But I think she was a very intelligent woman, really, and she really learned that role well. So what happened? Because Rummy was conducting this thing so terrible, and there was this rivalry. Uh, Condoleezza Rice stepped up. So what she did was she flew to Iraq and she met with this colonel who wasn't really published, but there was some success that he was having. And they didn't really talk about it too much. They talked about other things, but she saw this and she went and met with this colonel. And the colonel was telling her, her the reason that they were having success is because he had a strategy of clear, hold, and build. So they would go into a town, clear out the uh, rebels and insurgents, hold it and then they would start building so the building take place then they move over to to someplace else and they would do again clear hold and build chase those insurgents out do the same thing and so Condoleezza Rice took that and then she gets uh, in front of Congress in a public forum and she talks about clear hold and build she mentions this clear hold and build and she kind of focused on this well, it was pretty embarrassing for Donald Rumsfeld that the Secretary of State is the one who announces a strategy in which the U.S. could succeed in Iraq and not Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of State. And that actually spelled the end of Donald Rumsfeld's run as Secretary of, uh, of Defense. That knocked him out because clear holding bill came from the Secretary of State. And now George Bush wanted clear holding bill to be the strategy. And that wasn't Rummy's strategy. It was kind of Lisa Rice's strategy. So. There was how she took out her rival because he, you know, again, they rivaling, they have rivalries inside. And uh, the way she was looked upon, Rumsfeld was doing a lot of undermining. It's, I read some books on, on George Bush's uh, thing. And so that's one of the things I was explaining. But clear holding bill, that knocked Rummy out completely from Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. So anyway, in this book and in the, if you look back in the Israelite war, of Canaan that was the strategy it was clear hold and build and that's what they did they didn't just destroy a town and destroy a city they would destroy it hold it build and move on so they kept going through Joshua kept going through the land and he would clear it of all the enemies and then they, the enemies couldn't come back they would hold it and then the Israelites could start building after that that's what this is about in a spiritual way clear hold and build and you'll see that as I kind of continue through this. Sorry to take such a long introduction into it, but I just want to, to give you some background in this book. So look, let's let's just cover a couple of few, uh, few things. Now this book actually is only 41 pages and it's four chapters. It's, sh it's short, really, but it is a great read. It's a great read in terms of attitude. Now later on, uh, I would like to do a podcast on strategy for XJ Dubs because some folks are still involved and their families are still in it and there's it's difficulty knowing what you can do when your family's still involved and they're looking for you to stay involved like a lot of PMOs they have this issue uh, and then some ex who actually walk away they still have this issue and it's still a spiritual battle but you have to have strategy so we'll talk about that later anyway let me get into this. So look, chapter one. Uh, chapter one was the setting of the attitude to have when you're in a spiritual war. Because God told Joshua when he uh, succeeded Moses to be courageous and strong. Now again, God's talking directly with Joshua. And he's telling him to be courageous and strong. Now you have to go and fight. But be assured that you're going to have victory. And for you to act wisely in your in your uh, conduct of this war you have to read the law and meditate on the law that's going to help you be courageous and help you to be wise if you read it meditate and be obedient so you're going to need faith Joshua's going to need faith in order not to be overwhelmed and overcome by fear there's a, a, a interesting scripture in in uh, Joshua chapter 1 now in, in this verse, it, it's, let me say, the J-Dub Bible uses, 
I think, words that really aren't as clear in their meaning. But it is in verse 9, though, he says, Have I not commanded you, be courageous and strong. Notice this, do not be struck with terror or fear. For Jehovah your God is with you wherever you go. Now, it's interesting, terror or fear. What it was really talking about, be struck with trembling. So much so that you fall to your knees because you're so afraid. You're shaking. As I mentioned before, again, my own thing, but the, the scriptures do bear out certain things. They were fighting giants still. They were going into the land of Canaan. The giants were still there. From the different tribes of giants, from the whole group of Repium, they were fighting them. He says, don't tremble with fear. They don't tremble to where you can't move and don't fear to where you lack faith. So God was telling him that. That's a different thing when you're seeing I hear you, but when you see with your eyes the size of these cities, the size of the people, men can fear. But God told them, don't do that, and you're going to need all these things. You're going to need the law to act wisely and be courageous when you go into this land. And then we know that the, the first time they were about to conduct that warfare, and they were coming to Jericho, and then God's angel appeared to Joshua. And what was interesting is the way he appeared, Joshua wasn't afraid. Joshua approached him, even though this angel had a sword drawn. And so Joshua was like, you know, what's up? And then the angel told him who he was. And Joshua, you know, fell to his feet and bowed to him, you know, showing respect. The thing was, is that that angel appeared to him to let him know that there is a battle taking place in the spirit realm. Before you go in the physical realm. So we've got your back. That's what the angel was letting Joshua know. Now, we've got your back. So you keep going. See, so it, and you, again, you got to think about it. When God gave the law of reading Deuteronomy, he was talking about a lot of things that uh, or forbade a lot of things that the Canaanites were doing in the law, specifically because a lot of the things that they were doing were spiritistic. In other words, they were conjuring things from the spirit realm and doing sacrifices to get the approval of demons and wicked angels in order for them to have success so they were fighting spiritual forces and those spiritual forces were being called upon to defeat the Israelites so the war was spiritual as well as physical so they had to Joshua needed to understand that that's what that angel was there to tell him so we're there with you we got your back so hey they went into the land and they fought and God was with them. But the attitude, number one, courageous and strong. No fear. No trembling. Because as a Christian especially, God has our back. Jesus Christ has our back. Angels have our back. Holy Spirit has our back. That's what he was getting at. It's a spiritual warfare as well as a physical. Now, chapter 2. The other thing that was needed was faith with action. So it wasn't just they were going to go forward. They had to have action. This was part of the clear and hold strategy that they had. So they go into a town, uh, go to a city, and they clear it. See, even with Jericho, what did they do? They cleared it of everything. Rahab was saved, but everybody was taken out. And it was the angels, God's spirit, or the angels who dropped those walls. And then it was the angels that backed them up to go in and clear the town of all the inhabitants who were practicing these these despicable things. So they went to clear and hold. Now Jericho was leveled. That was theirs. And they can do what they want with it. So what they also had to realize though. Was that. In a spiritual way the attacks were going to come to them. So the demons weren't just going to lay down the angels that were backing them weren't just going to lay down they were going to come to them in a different way and in this book she was explaining how Joshua got and the older men got deceived by the Gibeonites I think if you you know been around Jada for a while you remember that story they got deceived and the point was in an attitude of faith and an attitude where you know that you have spiritual backing you suspect everything nothing is to go without suspicion.
So anybody that comes to you, I don't care if it's family members or what, who are J-dubs, you suspect everything. It doesn't mean that you look at them suspicious, but you're looking for the spiritual thing behind them. What are they doing to get us? That's what she was focusing on. They won't quit. The demons will not quit. What Joshua failed to do and the old men failed to do was ask for God's wisdom. So what he said, he told Joshua, you got to read the law to act wisely. That thing with the Gibeonites was not wise. Then you found out three days later that you've been deceived. So in the spiritual battles that we face, we have to recognize that God and Christ are there to help us with wisdom. That's what we have to look to through prayer and through study of his word. So it's a spiritual recognition. It's not the physical. It, when someone approaches it, that approach, we don't know the source. We don't know the why. And we, if we find out the why, is the why the really the why or is there something else to it? It doesn't mean you look at everyone suspicious. It's just that you take time to get the sense of what's behind them. What's their source? We have to seek guidance through prayer and through study of the Bible. You're dealing with, you're in a war, dealing with spirits who are trying to harm, so they need to be exposed. That's what she was pointing out in this book. Jesus said that just like with, with uh, Joshua and the Israelites, God had told them that wherever they go, they would put their foot on the necks of their enemies. And, and there was a situation where Joshua literally did that, put his foot on the neck of his enemies. And so Jesus said, hey, I, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. He was talking about demons. I give you that power too. But the thing is, we have to recognize them when they come. Because when it's, they, they can come you know, with a direct spiritual attack or they can come with a subtle attack in deception. Because there are a lot of spirits who are, well, they're deceptive. And that's what they do. They try to deceive. But we have to take a firm stand for righteousness is something that she had pointed out. Standing firm for righteousness helps to expose demons behind as a source of the attacks coming to us, especially through people. When we stand for what's right and what God says is right, then we recognize that source. So therefore, we see the importance of the attitude of faith. We have to actually trust that God's word uh, is righteous. And what he says through his son, Jesus Christ, is what is right. And once we stick with that, then we can recognize sources. So even if they come to us subtly, we don't have to accept it right away. Even if it sounds good, even, even if it sounds reasonable, we may have to pray for some guidance to see, well, what are they really doing? Or, or, how are they appealing to me? And is this an appeal from you, Lord Jesus, or is this an appeal from the spirit? Trust every, let I me mean, suspect everything. Don't trust any of it until we get clear guidance. That was a, I love that part about the book. That was really good because you just know, never know when it's coming. Uh, but anyway, I'll wait because I'll talk about this in a minute. All right, but now in chapter three, again, attitude. Now, this is toward spiritism. If we leave while well, we're in Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of that is the teaching of demons. When we leave, you pick up another spiritual source. You're going to fill yourself with another spiritual source. Where is that going to be? Is that going to be the teaching of demons? So we have to suspect everything. Any religion that we deal with is going to be from that same source. Teachings of demons. So they may show a measure of success and a measure of power even, but what's the source of the power? When you deal with teaching of demons, there's a thing called spiritism. And there's aspects of spiritism that can trap us, attract us first, and then trap us. So a Christian has to discern the source of whatever teaching comes upon us so wherever we're at someone's trying to teach us something 
what's the source? Just briefly, I remember getting into, I, I may have mentioned this before, but I got into a discussion uh, with, a, with a guy I called the Ungawa Black Power Brothers. Good guy, I mean, real, real good guy, but, you know, I told him flat, flat out that I was a Christian. And so he started talking about some of this other knowledge, and, and he was trying to speak against Christianity, but in a subtle way, because he wasn't trying to be ignorant or disrespectful of Christianity, but he was just trying to tell me that as a black man, that we can go into these things. So after some time in this discussion, I kind of let him go for a minute, and I just had to come back to him and say, okay, who's the source? I mean, who gave you this? Who told you this? I said, look, God said, I've done nothing in secret. I gave you everything. Jesus did the same thing. He exposed all his teachings and said, this is what you follow. It's been in a book that's been around that claims to be from a divine source. It's been around for thousands of years. And those teachings are there and they have not changed. That's the source. Nothing in secret there. Who's your source? That ended the conversation. He switched up to something else, completely away from the discussion that uh, we were having. So the source, exposing the source, because of course, demonic sources will hide. So we have to discern the source of anything that comes to us. Again, suspect everything is what she was pointing out in the book. Uh, spiritism, especially if there's a display of some sort of supernatural power, even small amounts, there has to be question as to what's the source of these supernatural powers. Even if, listen, even if the supernatural powers appear to be from Holy Spirit, and there are, in my belief, supernatural displays of Holy Spirit yet today, but you still have to question it because that's what Christ wants us to do. He doesn't want us to fall into any situation. He wants us to have a relationship with him in contact with him. He gives us the guidance and wisdom to understand these things. So you look at the effects of the spiritual life of the person. What's the effect on the person or the people in reality to know what the source is? It's something that Jesus had said in John chapter 14 and chapter 16. Uh, the, the difference between, well, let me just say, you can take it as the difference between a demonic source and uh, a godly source. Is that Holy Spirit will teach you. So the teachings will actually, we read God's word, and then if there's some sort of wisdom that needs to be pointed out, there are circumstances, and then Jesus will use Holy Spirit to call to mind, to relate to that, to that situation, to know if it's, this is from a, a godly source or is, it's a spiritual, or, or excuse me, a, a demonic source. Because the teaching from God's word is, once we get it into our minds, Holy Spirit brings it back up. So in other words, the understanding, the wisdom comes from within us through Holy Spirit. The other sources are on the outside. Now, Jesus said this. I thought this was very interesting when you look at it. And she pointed this out uh, in the book about Holy Spirit. It says this is in John 16, 13. It says, however, when that one comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth. And he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Now check this out. And he will declare to you the things to come. Future. See, and people go for divination because they want to know the future. Okay, that's a source from without. But the Holy Spirit declares a future to Christians. And it comes from within because Holy Spirit is in us. So, therefore, we'll know the source of... On something that we see on the outside because God uh, and Christ through Holy Spirit would teach us from within whether that's valid or not. I love that point. I mean, that was really powerful to me. Therefore, once we have that, there's the aggression that we can have. The attitude of aggression towards spiritual war because we know God through Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ, the angels is backing us up because it's coming from within us because Holy Spirit is in us. And that's how he teaches. That was chapter three was powerful to me. Very powerful. And I, and I really respect what she put in there. And now the other point in chapter four, chapter four was all about the recognition of curses. And we recognize them from their effects. And there's a need then once we recognize the curse, it can be upon us too. There's a need to break that curse 
using the name of Jesus Christ in prayer to break that specific curse. So we recognize the effect. You see the curse. We recognize the effects that, yeah, I'm indeed under a curse or this. My household is under a particular curse. And then we got to break that curse using the name of Jesus Christ. So she talks a lot about the curses that people are under. And that's part of spiritual warfare. When someone is under a curse, that effect. The person that's under a curse who is now applying themselves to you can now put us under that same curse. And she used several examples through there, but the one of the most important was was Achan. Achan brought uh, in J. Dub Bible a thing devoted to destruction. In other words, it, he brought something accursed into the camp. What happened to the camp? The camp got a curse so that when they went to attack Ai, they were defeated before Ai and people lost their lives in that war. Why? Because the Israelites were under a curse for bringing something that was accursed into the camp. So it's the recognition that we can come under a curse by associating with the cursed people. And we bringing them into our camp in a spiritual way. So she talks about that in, in chapter 4. Again, excellent. She, she used examples of other curses that uh, predated that were in the Bible that predated the nation of Israel. Now, again, if you heard my podcast about curses, I was just I was mentioning how the curses are real. And the nation of Israel, those blessings and cursings were not just for the nation of Israel, but it was for all mankind. It was just explained in the law in Deuteronomy. That's all it was. They were explained. And so the nation of Israel would come under a curse, but so were other nations, other people. They were a curse too because they didn't know God's law and they were had submitted to it to these particular principles and things in life these particular laws and they, they were dealing with uh, demonic sources so a curse is a curse it doesn't matter who is where it comes from it's going to have an impact so that was the book in itself again it's a short book 41 pages four chapters but extremely powerful in my opinion uh, helping us to have the right attitude towards spiritual warfare, the recognition that whatever we do and any time in life, we're in that spiritual war. Now, but what do we want to be? Do we want to be the victims of the war or do we want to be the aggressors in the war so that we're not victimized, but we become skilled in warfare in a spiritual way and we recognize when we're under attack because we are constantly as a Christian. No, we are constantly as humans under an attack. It's just that Christians have the ability to fight back for real. Because we got backing from uh, from God, Christ, and from Holy Spirit, and the angels in heaven. All right, so now how does all of this apply to us who are ex-J-dubs? And this is what I was wanting you to hang on for. Again, it's the attitude. And I'll just briefly run through these chapters again, but apply it to us as XJ Dubs. It's the attitude in chapter one. We are in a spiritual war. We have to clear, hold, and build. So it's not just getting, recognizing the demons, it's getting them out of us. That's territory. Us, our minds, hearts, and bodies, getting them out, number one, getting them out of our house. And then we build, clear, hold, and build. We have to have the right attitude. Remember what we're fighting. If you are an ex dub remember that there was a lot of spiritism in the religion, a lot of demonic activity within the religion, and it has to be for yourself cleared. We got to clear those demons out, hold, and then build in a spiritual way. See, we need to read continue you know, fill that void with God's word and with prayer and then once we kind of get the sense that we're in the war and we can start operating in the war now you can go and be disruptive see and I had mentioned before if you go you still got to go to the kingdom hall let's say you're still with your family you can go to the kingdom hall and disrupt the spiritual atmosphere that's there the kingdom hall is a Masonic hall think about it it's a Freemason organization they call the the, the meeting places halls just like 
the Masons do. So it's the Kingdom Hall, it's a Masonic Hall. The old ways of of, of uh, building the Kingdom Hall was absolutely Masonic and how they designed it. So you're still in the Masonic organization, that's what it was. So we got to get in, if you, you go there, you can disrupt the spiritual atmosphere through prayer with angels, you know, through Holy Spirit, you can do all that. But you got to do it in your home first. And the way that we do it is, number one, first of all, standing for righteousness. Righteousness has to be the key. That's why we need God's word to understand what righteousness is. And I'm not talking about any sort of religious thing. I'm just talking about doing what's right according to God's eyes. Let me give you an example. Back in my early 20s, I was pioneering. All right. Uh, I was all in my whole jade up mindset. And I was working part time. I was going to school. I was pioneering, but I was still living in my father's house. Now, my father stopped going to the meetings at that time. You know, he, he never was really in it for real. I mean, he never really progressed in the religion. He had a lot of issues with the people there and all that. You know. Okay. So he was never really in it. So he stopped going for a while because he was kind of discouraged behind some things. And for a time, I started kind of looking down on my dad because he wasn't doing all the J-Dub stuff. He really wasn't involved and, you know, the family was, but he wasn't. And my dad had to check me one day, for real. Because the reason that I could do all these J-Dub things in my 20s, pioneer and all that, it was because I lived in his house. Because he was financially supporting me. It's because he permitted it in that house. And when and in that time, it was actually kind of hard to come about jobs at that time. It was really kind of a down economy. But my dad was helping me out. He would give me little odd jobs to do and then pay me. So that I always had money in my pocket because, you know, that part time job couldn't keep things going. So he was supporting me. He was paying for my schooling. I could pioneer and do all that. And. And do all those things. Work for free for that organization only because he allowed it. And then I got the nerve to look down on him because he didn't go to meetings for a time. He didn't go out and field service. He had to pull my card on that one day. And you know what? That was righteous what he did. It was absolutely righteous. He stood for what was right. The only reason you can do this is because of me. Now if you had to go out there on your own, and, and which is some years later, when, when he's... I was renting from him at the time, still low rent. I could still pioneer. But once he said, all right, son, it's time for you to go ahead and get your life together, that pioneering stopped. I had to go work full time. I couldn't do the 90 hours. That was done. So when he checked me, he was absolutely righteous. He was far more righteous than I was. Even though he wasn't going to the meetings. And that's the same for a lot of you ex dubs Who have families that's still in it. Family who you are supporting. The righteousness comes in you being a good head. And you taking care of your family if you're a male. If you're female. The righteousness comes in being a good wife or husband. Or whatever. Or a good wife or good mother. Or whatever you're doing. It's about being righteous. Righteousness will help you to recognize the demonic sources. That's why we stand for what's right. That's why we need God's word to stick with it. That's how we can get aggressive in the spiritual war. That's having the right attitude. So if you are ex up, this is how this book applies the attitude and getting righteous. And I've always noticed this, and I've said this before too in previous podcasts. If you leave, don't let never go on your knees don't ever let them tell you or talk to you as though you're struggling you're not struggling you don't have to go back you don't need that to be a spiritual person in fact it gets you away from the demonic sources that's that's hindering you chapter two again it's about the recognition of the sources that's behind whatever's coming to you suspect everything a lot of XJ does talk about the love bombing that takes place when they start calling with love and all that oh we miss you we want you coming back and all this other kind of stuff they, they, they call and they talk to, to us about that right I mean, you had that a lot of you have had that well but who are the people that are calling 
See, suspect everything. That love is not love. That's deception. Because once we get back, we got to deal with the exact same people, the exact same atmosphere, the exact same teachings that's calling us back to this demonic source. So suspect everything. We have to learn to be guided by Holy Spirit. And again, back to the standing up to what's righteous. And understanding that when we stand for righteousness, the demons will show themselves. Let a J-Dub love bomb you and then hit them with a scriptural verse like John 14, 6. But why do I need the organization Jehovah's Witnesses and all that when Jesus said no one comes to the Father except through me? Watch the attitude change. Hit them with a, a matter of fact, just check this out. Just hit them with constantly using the name Jesus and see how they respond. That love bombing will change to hate bombing right away because they don't teach Jesus. That's how you recognize the source by standing for what's right, using the name of Jesus Christ. And you'll see all that comes apart. All that love stops. And then you just laugh about it. See, and then go thank God, thank Christ. OK, yeah, I learned to stand for righteousness and I see uh, I see the demonic behind this. That ain't real love. That's not agape. Chapter three is about the spiritism. And in two ways is recognizing the spiritistic teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. And then recognizing the spiritistic teachings after leaving Jehovah's Witnesses. We have to recognize the source behind the teaching that we start to look into. And what's the long term outcome of the teaching? Once we recognize that and get a sense of that and we see the source then we'll know how to properly deal with it. You will know that we're under attack from demonic forces, that they're coming to us, and all they're going to do is steal from us. That's what they're going to do. They're going to take our time and energies and change us to doing something in their behalf, sucking the life out of us, just like Jehovah's Witnesses did. Think about it. How much free time, volunteer time, you put into Jehovah's Witnesses? That's stealing. Your time is valuable. In this world, you should be paid for your time. But we volunteering. Yeah, you got treasures in heaven. Well, let me spend some of them here on the earth. I do that by taking my time to myself, giving it to Christ directly. So that's recognizing the spiritual, the, the, the source, the spiritual source behind whatever teaching you fall into. So if we're looking, we're searching for something else, 99% of it's going to be spiritistic. Some of it's going to be good, but it's going to be spiritistic in the long run. So you just take what you can get, but we need God and Christ to help us to identify what's there and to use godly wisdom in taking what we need and moving forward. Because there are some things out there that are helpful, truthfully. There are a few teachings that are helpful, but long term, it's not helpful if we follow the complete teaching. We have to recognize that through spiritual wisdom. And that only comes internally from God's spirit being in us so that now God uses that spirit to project a spiritual understanding so we can accept what we need, discard what's not there. Now, the last thing in chapter four is the recognition of the effects of curses. Now, listen, I'll tell you what, I've shared this before, but let me read this again. This is in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, however, even if we are an angel out of heaven were to declare to you the good news, something beyond the good news or gospel, we declare to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I now say again, whoever is declaring to you as good news, something beyond what you accepted, let him be accursed. All right. So here again. We have to recognize that when we were Jehovah's Witnesses, that was a good news, a gospel beyond what's in the scriptures. It was a curse. That's why there's demonic effects. That's why there's not much success because we were under a curse. We got to break that curse using the name of Jesus for real. So even if you walk away from it, the curse is still there. You got to break the curse as soon as you walk away. Even if you are mentally out of it now, you got to break the curse. Because that is not the Jesus that's in the scriptures. That is not the Jehovah, the Yahweh or Jabe that's in the scriptures. That is a different gospel 
than what's in the scriptures. So therefore, we came under a curse. All religions teach a different gospel that's in the scripture because it's, it's the religion is to benefit the religion, not for the people. Therefore, it's a curse. So we got to break that curse. If you go back to, I, I, I'll read this because I think this was absolutely powerful too in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4 where he says for as it is if someone comes and preaches a Jesus other than the one we preached or you receive a spirit other than the one you received or good news other than what you accepted you easily put up with them a different spirit a different Jesus that Jesus that we learn in Jehovah's Witnesses is not the Jesus of the scriptures and you know it's not the Jesus of the scriptures because if you use Jesus in the scriptures to a Jehovah's Witness they will curse you they get upset they get mad they get angry why because it's not the Jesus in the scriptures so therefore when we were in Jehovah's Witnesses and I will say this too that when I was in Jehovah's Witnesses I saw I saw the spirit move on people but that wasn't Holy Spirit now that I understand things what I saw as an elder Things happening, that was another spirit. That was not the spirit that comes from the teaching about the Christ. It's a different spirit. We got to break that curse. And when we break that curse, we are actually now free of the religion. Now we're free to go and start devastating in the territory that we have, whether it's ourselves, our homes, or the, the, the uh, kingdom hall, if you still need, feel a need to attend the meetings with your family. Now you can go in and start conducting warfare according to the real spiritual warfare that the scriptures lay out. Because we recognize things. But you got to break that first. You got to break that first. So I think this book is absolutely essential for having the right attitude in conducting the spiritual warfare that we need to conduct once we leave the religion. And to get ourselves mentally and spiritually stable to deal with life in warfare which is the warfare that all mankind face so hey i just want to throw that out uh give me some comments too uh put some some comments down because uh just let me know what you think of of those thoughts that, that i'm sharing uh that book is available on you know kindle or you know, amazon i mean you can get it uh electronically i think google play has the, the book you know 41 pages not very long but I think it's a good book for the witnesses, for XJ Dubs. Uh, there's another book that I thought was really good. I'm not going to do a review of it, but I, I do want to talk again about strategy. Uh, and that's why I would like some comments. Uh, what's been your strategy? What situation are you in? Because I'd like to, to add to it. Uh, the book was called Battles of the Bible that these two men uh, wrote. They were uh, two Israeli men, and they wrote because they understood the topography of the area in the, of the nation of Israel and they saw strategies in the Bible that what God would say do this and then they recognized it as a strategy one of them was a professor and one of them I think was a former president I can't remember for sure but it was actually pretty good but talking about strategy uh, and so when we look at the conduct of warfare with the Canaanites in the land of Canaan there were strategies that God employed and therefore, you have to have strategy in the spiritual war when you're leaving Jehovah's Witnesses. Because everyone's circumstances are different. So, so that's why I asked you to leave me some comments. Uh, to talk about the, what you thought of this. And if, there, if you have a situation of war and how we can incorporate spiritual strategy in conducting the rest of our lives. In dealing with our family members or whomever who are still in the religion. So anyway, that's all I have for today. I appreciate you all listening. And uh, I will talk to you again on a future podcast. Take care.